In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a local sheriff's department is backpedaling after its officers falsely arrested at least a dozen gay men for, quote, crimes against nature. An undercover deputy headed to a park looking for gay men, while his partners from East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Department hid nearby to record any exchanges. The deputy struck up a conversation with a 65-year-old man he saw in a parked car. How about you and me get gay? After denying being a cop, he asked the man if he had any condoms, and then suggested they go back to his pad for some drinks and some fun. When they arrived at the apartment, the deputy slapped cuffs on the senior Fuck citizen. Thing. Sorry, Grandpa, these aren't the fuzzy kind. The sheriff denies targeting gays, saying his deputies were just trying to protect children from lewd acts. I'm Sheriff Sid Gotro, asking you to be safe. But the man who got busted didn't agree to have sex in public, and he wasn't even engaged in prostitution because money wasn't involved. So how did the department justify the arrest? Deal? Well, by invoking an anti-sodomy law, the kind the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional. 10 years ago. Tell it to the judge. The DA didn't press charges because no crime had been committed. In fact, this was just the latest in at least a dozen similar arrests dating back to 2011, according to the advocate of Baton Rouge. Makes you wonder how long all of this would have gone on had it not been for the newspaper's investigation. You filming me? You filming me, punk? But come on. No cops had better things to do? Baton Rouge suffers from the nation's eighth highest murder rate, and homicide has increased 40% from a decade ago. So yeah, it might be more dangerous, but maybe deputies could spend less time busting gay men and more time busting murderers. Man, they just can't mess up fast enough. Well, Louisiana is pretty much traditionally a corrupt state anyway. You know, you're kind of looking at this. We're collecting up the stories off the internet. They're offensive at best, but police brutality is one of those things that conservatives refuse to face up to. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. You're tuned into Video Radio, taking a look at, well, the way the cops are doing it wrong. Exactly, you know, it was still people power that actually got this to happen. Caught on camera from multiple angles, Sammy Yatim's death brought Toronto to a boil. Today, three weeks after a police officer fired nine shots at the 18-year-old, the province's police watchdog agency announced it is charging Officer James Forcillo with second-degree murder. Yatim's sister was succinct on Twitter, Good morning, Justice, she wrote. But the family didn't stop at that. In a statement, they blamed all who were there that night, writing... Over 20 uniformed police officers were present and no one stepped forward to stop the gunshots or offer any mediation. Experts say the video evidence was too compelling to ignore, with a knife wielding a team 20 feet and three stairs away inside an empty streetcar. Three shots, then after a six second pause, six more. And that was before he was tasered. With over three million views on YouTube, the videos have intensified the unease between Torontonians and police. The case is shocked, but it's not the first. In 2010, Officer David Cavanaugh was charged with second-degree murder. He was acquitted earlier this year. In fact, the Crown has a terrible record when it comes to trying police officers charged with murder or manslaughter. Of the six previous cases, all were acquitted. Only the Kavanaugh case, which the Crown is appealing, remains unresolved. But none elicited anywhere close to the response the Yatim case has. Farcillo's representatives know the public is watching closely and have most likely already formed an opinion. Mike Trollet, Global News Toronto. Now, people did make that happen. That they did. Okay. We got a cop charged, got his uh, paycheck taken away. We stood out in the street six times at the end. There was like six of us. Okay, but we saw it right through to the end. Of course, you got, what, six months probation? Ah, I got a slap on the wrist. Just like there in Toronto, they murdered them in the streets and they're acquitted. Oh, yeah, sorry, we found a, you know, there was a piece of dental floss out of place in the back of the <laughs> of the chair, and that just throws the whole thing out. Well, that's what happens when you have the cops investigating themselves. So now we have this story. Oh. Earlier this month, Simona Tibu made a routine trip to Edmonton from Camrose. The dentist was heading to the city to see patients. Tibu says she was pulled over. According to her, the sheriff was aggressive, hitting her car and window. Things escalated, Tibu says, when she threatened to record him with her cell phone. She says once she got out of the car, she was arrested and pushed to the ground. He hit me in the head. I felt the heat in my head. Then he smashed my head on the pavement on the road until I was, was full of blood. 
Tibu says these pictures show the injuries she suffered, her face and body badly bruised. Since she brought her story to Global News, reaction has been divided. Some sympathize with Tibu, others wonder if there's more to the story. Witnesses did stop at the scene. One called 911, another took these pictures. The sheriff also called for backup. He's been placed on desk duty while an internal investigation takes place. After the, the, the initial complaint, um, there will be uh, other witnesses spoken to, if available, evidence reviewed and therefore find out the, the results of the, the complaint. Only if the sheriff is found to be in the wrong can the RCMP recommend charges be pressed against him. Otherwise, the matter will be dealt with privately. For her part, Tibu has been charged with resisting arrest and obstruction of justice. Fashi Capellos, Global News. A protest is being organized to support Tibu at her first court appearance in September. So, being beaten up by the cops is... Resistance to arrest? <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, you know, police assault is like regular assault, except you get charged afterwards. Yeah, you're assaulting a police officer. I guess you hit his face or hit his fist with your face. Yeah, too many times, man. Remember, when you're hitting a police officer's fist with your face or your guts, you know, take it easy on them. they got a hard job. And of course, they're so you know. transparent about, you know, when things are being conducted. Uh, yeah, I know. We've been taking a look at the fact of information requests. Now, we've got a problem within government, and that's the police and the government itself. The PMO's office, the prime minister's office, you know, they've actually had to file information requests there. But here with the RCMP, okay, wow. come on. Are you guys really straight up guys, or are you just a bunch of rats hiding behind? I think the latter. The RCMP is Canada's symbol of law and order, but it seems our country's top cops are breaking the law. According to the Federal Information Commissioner, the Mounties aren't responding to information requests, which is a breach of our information laws. But Suzanne Legault told Global News, quote, This past year, at some point, they completely stopped responding. I've never seen that in the four years since I've been here. The RCMP says it is responding to requests, but it's dealing with a deluge of ATIPs, noting last year the number of information requests increased by nearly 400 percent compared to the previous one. Still one former Mountie says that's not an excuse. The act doesn't, uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I guess depending which side you're on, does not have an exemption because you don't have the capacity. The RCMP is hiring more staff to deal with the additional number of A-tips, but the Information Commissioner Any notes question? other departments the aren't the doing much better. Legault points out there has been a 50% increase in the, the number of complaints to her office. The opposition staff. says that's the Conservatives' fault. If you look where we stand in the rankings now under the present Conservative government, we are seen down below many uh, third world tin pot dictatorships. While complaints to the Information Commissioner are up, she has no power to force any department or agency uh, to turn over information. But that's not the case in some provinces. Government departments in BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec and Prince Edward Island can be forced to open their files. In other jurisdictions, even at the federal level, if the department doesn't want to respond, the filing cabinets remain shut. So not only do we have cops investigating cops, we have cops refusing to provide information on cops. Hey, there's no transparency over here. <laughs> hey, man, you're not getting a look at our files, man. You have to come back with more paperwork. Yeah, it's not going to do anything. Yeah, well, we're too busy. There's too many complaints against us. <laughs> now, okay, what does that say? They had to hire extra staff to handle the number of formal information requests that they were deluged by. And they don't provide the information freely. They have to be forced. Yes, and that's got to tell you exactly where their mentality is. Exactly. Save ass. Sorry about that. Too bad about your luck. We do have a quick clip. We want you to stay informed about police brutality issues. You be the judge. Check this out. Sergei Zubko of London, Ontario, didn't know who the strangers were who knocked on his window and told him to come outside at about 9 p.m. July 22nd. When he got to the door, the 87-year-old man saw several police officers and his wife, who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. When he went to speak to his wife, the officers attacked him, 
yanking his hands behind his back and throwing him face first to the driveway. The officers had arrived after Zupko's wife told an acquaintance that there was a bad man in the house. Despite the fact that Zupko had done nothing wrong, police are pressing charges of assaulting an officer because the confused elderly man was uncooperative. So when you have nothing but military training, if you're impatient, you charge him with assault because he was being obstructive? Uncooperative? He's trying to defend his wife, who's in dementia, and I have a parent. I lost my mom to Alzheimer's. you got to have some restraint, but these cops have no restraint. And they're afraid of elderly seniors now? And they had to drag him across the ground. I mean, look at the guy. I know. He's in his 90s. But no restraint whatsoever. Camilla McGuire proved that one in Victoria, just around the Buddy Tavares case. And then now we've got this lunacy going on. Okay, straight out. Predictive programming. The fear is real as a man hijacks a school bus filled with students. It's a drill, but for some on this bus, it's a nightmare turned into reality. As emotions run wild on this bus, an audience on the other side of town watches it all on a live feed. It's an audience made up of school teachers, administrators, and transportation directors. This heart-pounding drill is a lesson for them. The bus eventually makes its way to the same lot where the crowd of school officials have been watching all the terror unfold. But the drill is just getting started. It's also where first responders and SWAT teams are standing by to rescue those on board. One by one, students are taken into safety. Students we spoke to say every moment on the bus felt like the real thing. I didn't know what was going on because, like, at the start, he pulled out a, like, he was just a normal person. He pulls out a gun and then a mask and puts it all on. And then he starts tying everybody down and it just got really scary. Organizers say planning for the drill began in May, focusing on every detail. When a bad person would board the bus, um, the driver would not know that he or she was going to be on the bus, so we wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Students say it's an experience they'll never forget and one they hope to never have to relive. It feels good to know that when this does happen, there's people who are there to stop it. Zach Pitts, 13 ABC. Action. And I disagree. I don't think that that has any purpose whatsoever. Well, they can't find any real terrorists to terrify the children with. Yeah, so they got to dress up cops and then walk everybody through the nonsense. And it doesn't seem like a real drill. Didn't they tell you when there was going to be a fire drill? Yeah, that's right. But this is a surprise. Yeah, surprise. We've got, uh, it was like during, uh, before the July the 4th, the irony day. They had all those terror drills in the United States. Oh, yeah, and the guys who shot themselves? <laughs> During Gun Appreciation Week. Uh, you know, go take a look at some of our older shows because we've just been mocking this thing outright. Uh, we're going to finish things off. We've got kind of an offensive story here. This guy made it through World War II. A 95-year-old resident of a senior citizen's home was killed by police on July the 27th. Officers from the Park Forest Police Department responded to a call from an ambulance company about a combative resident who had threatened staff and paramedics with a metal cane and a shoehorn. When police arrived, the elderly man allegedly picked up what was described as a butcher knife. Police used a taser and then beanbag rounds to compel him to surrender. He was taken to a nearby hospital where he died a few hours later. So that's the way that... Uh you tell the story. Yeah. Don't worry. The police are here to help you. Yeah. Six months of military training. That person can help you really yeah, deal with you Alzheimer's know. and old people. 95-year-old World War II vet. Let's show up with five cops with riot gear. We also had a story where that they were attacking a tomato farm. Oh, we didn't have time. Raid, yeah. There was a SWAT raid on a tomato farm. Do your own research and join a police brutality group. Make sure we end the problem by mounting a camera, no camera on these guys and throwing them in jail if they turn the camera off. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. We've got more segments coming up in the Municipal Sustainability Project that we're promoting right now. Remember, there are solutions. We're part of those things. So are you. Stay tuned. More to come. Radio Free Canada and Video Radio.